would please open your New Testaments to the book of Jude. This morning we tried to bring out and emphasize what we're experiencing in this country. The great changes and most of them not for good that are going on and the sad state of affairs among most people as far as their view of God and Christ and the Bible and that most have been caught up in a secularism and even if they are not atheists or agnostics they're not much interested in what the book says that is the Bible as the word of God and that men must obey it their concept of God and their concept of Christ and all sorts of things religious is pretty much says do as you please and be sincere in it and whatever there is that's God will be happy with you. There's not much that calls on anybody to be sober minded, to be self disciplined, to give up much of anything in order to be obedient to a way that doesn't appeal to those who would live on the level of the flesh. I think that as we've talked about even in class this morning in the auditorium class and then again in the sermon about the situation of the culture and society of the Roman Empire and then how much we have become like that when you read Romans 1 and the Gentiles desiring not to retain God in their knowledge and thus they walked away from God and God gave them up. And we are in the midst of that, different people at different stages, many different false religions are all around us. Now Jude is greatly concerned. He is so much so concerned that as he was going to write on that which was common to every faithful Christian, he was constrained to change his mind. And we see Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Let me mention just a moment the idea of being preserved. Now, we all know what uh, preserves are as we normally use it when it comes to food. And so you can keep them. They'll be around a while at least till you eat them up. But it's keep them around. They won't spoil well, in Christ Jesus, faithfully serving Christ, we are preserved. We will not suffer the second eternal death in a devil's hell. We are assured of salvation forever in a glorified body like Christ presently possesses forever in heaven. So Jude begins in this way. And even in his first few words, he reminds those he's addressing of their preservation, what all they owe to Jesus Christ and the gospel of Christ. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Again, a great disposition of mind. One each one of us should have toward one another. Uh, I tell you that our fellowship that is taught in the scriptures that's to exist between Christians, I think in the years to come for the few that remain faithful will become more and more precious to us, even it must have been to those brethren of 2,000 years ago in such a society as they lived in culture that dominated virtually everything. Notice verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful. Now, there's a need that must be met. Well, was it needful that the common salvation be discussed? Well, if it was, this is a greater need, and it was for him to write to them about a certain matter. And that is, notice it wasn't they didn't know they were to do this, but he wanted to exhort them to do what they already knew. Exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. The American Standard Version 1901 says, once for all delivered to the saints, and I like that better. Thus the faith here is a synecdoche that stands for the whole New Testament system or gospel plan. And we're to contend for all of it together or any part of it. That's our job. We don't need to say, let somebody else do it. I don't have to. If you're faithful to the Lord, to the best of your ability and knowledge, you are to contend for the faith and any constituent element of it. And the faith, then, is the New Testament system. And as it was in those days, so it is today. 
all around us are people who don't care a thing in the world about this or else if they do, they have corrupted it and they don't understand pure, primitive New Testament Christianity. They polluted it with the doctrines of men and others have just simply renounced anything to do with the God of the Bible and Jesus Christ and the Bible itself is the Word of God. Notice that this was once for all delivered. There's not other revelations to come and hasn't been since Jude wrote this or since the New Testament was completed as the last few verses of the book of Revelation chapter 22 makes it clear. And Galatians 1, there's not another gospel. Another there's from a Greek word that means a gospel of a different kind from what I, Paul, preach to you. If somebody comes to you with a gospel that's a different kind from what I preach to you, let him be cut off from God. And so the preservation of the gospel must be in our minds and the preservation of preaching the whole counsel of God must ever be in our minds. In this society, then the word of God must be before our eyes at all times. And we must be doing all we can to keep it before everybody else. As you look at this, you'll see that the occasion for him to write this is found in uh, verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares. They slipped in. You were unaware of them. And what's wrong with them? Well, if you'll notice, he first of all deals with what their just desserts are before he tells us, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They're teaching false doctrine in these areas. We don't know all of the specific details of their doctrines. You don't have to know all the specific details of their doctrine if they're doing this in the process of preaching whatever error they preached. As these brethren at this time were to go and live daily as the New Testament taught Christians to live, there was then this special need. It was needful, full of need for Jude to write to Christians and say, we might say it this way, get up off of yourselves and do what you know you ought to. Be a soldier of the Lord. Uh, I'm in the Lord's army. And get up and do the fighting wherever it is with the neighbor across the back fence or wherever you get a chance to defend the truth and defend it. Put on the whole armor of God and stand accordingly. So he writes to exhort them to contend earnestly for the faith. It bothers me that some brethren over the years and long before I discovered America had the idea that, well, if it's the truth, you don't need to defend it. I don't know where we ever learned that. When the Bible is full of material that tells us that truth must be defended by those who love, believe, and practice it. And so here he is in writing part of the New Testament of Jesus Christ telling them that it was needful for me to tell you to get up and face these people, re reprove them and rebuke them, expose the error they're teaching and refute it. That's part of our duty. If I'm to be concerned about helping the sick, and I am, if I'm to do what I can about helping the orphans and widows, and I'm supposed to do that, it is part of pure and undefiled religion, James 1.27, then I'm also a part of that being Christian, and all that means of Christ, to be busy about exposing error and marking false teachers and warning the precious blood-bought body of Christ of those who would destroy it, who would lead people away into various kinds of doctrine, whether they're binding where God has not bound in his word on people, or whether they're loosing brethren from what God has bound upon them. That's the only way the doctrine of Christ can be corrupted as far as teaching contrary to what's in the New Testament, that is the authority of Christ in the words of the New Testament. Now notice in the book of Jude, we see in verses 3 through 7, I emphasize again, those that had crept in unaware. Some preacher said one time, uh, slipped in the side door and we weren't watching. Now they were ordained to this condemnation. Now that's where I was headed a moment ago. He tells us the condemnation, but then he lets us know it's because of their teaching. And they're ungodly men. 
Well, a person can believe in God and believe in Christ as the Son of God and believe the Bible is the Word of God and be in error. But in those areas where they're in error, they're certainly not on God's side. They're certainly not promoting what he wants promoted and opposing what he wants opposed. And so in those areas, they would be ungodly. They change the grace of God and lasciviousness or rather licentiousness. We have a lot of that going on today. People say, well, grace is God's favor, and after all, you can't be perfect anyway, so God will just cover it as if to take away any effort on our part to keep ourselves obedient to God. Yet all along, we realize the Bible says what Ecclesiastes does. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Or as in Hebrews 5, 9, that Christ is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Well, what if you don't obey? Well, you're going to be destroyed in the last day in the sense of eternal separation from God. He exhorts them to remember how God dealt with such people in the past. People look at the Old Testament and they see God punishing this one, that one, and the other one. They say that... You don't see that God in the New Testament. Well, you just don't know how to look. You need to have your glasses uh, rechecked or something. Your spiritual eye needs to go to the ophthalmologist or the optometrist that deals with such matters. And you remember that even uh, John in writing talked about some folks over there that they needed to get their own eye salve that they might be able to see. Well, he's talking about spiritually, seeing what you need to do in that way. So they had to face reality. They had to first face reality in their own lives. I suggest to you that that is not as easily done as it is easily said. To face your life and your thinking and all of that in the light of the plain word of God. Am I bringing my life in subjection to the truth of God? That's what it's all about. That's living the Christian life. That's what is meant in being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So after having rescued the children of Israel out of Egypt, he destroyed those who did not believe. That's the point. Now, really what you have in the Old Testament is example after example of what happens when people sin and how God thinks about it. It's not that he's changed his mind about it in the New Testament. It's just that in the New Testament there's emphasized ways of the way of forgiveness, that God's offered forgiveness. It tells, as we sing in the old song, the wonderful story of love. Tell it to me again. But the outcome is the same for all those who die outside of Christ or die apostate or in their sins in Christ. Angels even, showing how God operates, were, who sinned were cast into a prison of their own. And then you see him talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. People want to look at things uh, Today, as we talked about this morning and has been talked about, and Eric did a good job on emphasizing these. I told him earlier because of his sermon got me thinking along this line, so uh, I just tagged all this on the end of it. Uh, but when you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, why are they selected by the Holy Spirit out of the book of Genesis? Why particularly? Because if you read Romans 1, it was just as bad in the first century as far as homosexualism has ever been. And so even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and here's the key, and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Well, I guess there are people read that and say, well, that's a nice Star Wars story. Sounds like another episode from Middle Earth. And where's the hobbits in it? And that's about as far as it goes. But if we realize he's talking about what is actually going to happen to most people in this world and specifically those who die guilty of the sin of homosexuality. It is real and we need to face the reality of it and looking at our society and culture, looking back at that one when this book was originally written, you can see how up to date this book is. All of us need to be reminded 
that when all is said and done, everybody that's ever lived from Adam to the last person on this earth will be in heaven or hell forever. And if I can understand anything at all about the Bible, specifically the New Testament, very few, comparatively speaking, as far as those who have lived on this earth will enter glory land's way. The straight and narrow is not chosen by people. They're too easily led to live according to this world. Now notice he talks about people being filthy dreamers. This is our next part we want to emphasize because he's talking about a condemnation of the wicked because there's some people who don't really believe the wicked if they can find a wicked person would be condemned. And they think it's terrible that you would think anybody would be lost. You can say people will be lost. Just don't say that brother so-and-so will be lost. Just don't say that your neighbor will be lost. And then you might get by with that even if you don't say that they're where the rich man is in that fire, tormenting that flame, just wishing for a Somebody would have a thing the world do with to touch his finger to water and touch it to my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. You don't think that way. That is reality. Think for a moment. Everybody that has died that was accountable to God is either where Lazarus and Abraham was in paradise awaiting the resurrection or they're where the rich man was. Now, with your general knowledge of the New Testament regarding how many people are going to be lost? Where do you think most people are nowadays once they've died? They're certainly not over where Abraham is as far as those accountable to God because the Lord says, many are called and few are chosen. So this ought to be something that says, look at the reality. God is showing you that which is beyond the human eye to see. That which is beyond the reality of physical things, empirical facts. He's giving you a picture of what will be as real or realer then than our life in the flesh here is real as we perceive it through our five senses. So likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Now let me ask you, if you just halfway keep up with the news, what have these people been doing out here running all over the place? They've been doing this very thing. They're filthy dreamers, they defile the flesh, they despise dominion, and they speak evil of dignities. And then he drops back and talks about the business of Michael. Michael, of course, is an archangel, and that tells us about the decently and ordered affairs of heaven, because an archangel means there are uh, different orders of angels, and there are archangels over other angels. Now you say, tell me more about it. Uh, just live faithful and get there and find out. That's the biggest thing. But he gives us what we need to know. If God wants things done decently and in order in the church on earth, then he's certainly got it all in order as it is in heaven. So we see then that Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, uh, he disputed about the body of Moses, and does not, does, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now, I don't know all the details about that, but he was contending with the devil about what he calls the body of Moses. Let me ask you this. Moses was a type of Christ. The body of Moses are those that followed the law of Moses. Now, who would that be? Israel of old. The body of Moses. I don't have any problem with I say the body of Christ. We know that's the church. Well, under the Mosaic dispensation, the body of Moses were the Israelites. Now, there was something going on, and it was beyond the human eye to see. And it was this Michael, the archangel, contending with the devil, and they disputed over something. I like to think about that because it tells me that while we battle to keep each one of ourselves in harmony with God's will, constantly keep ourselves teachable and we're studying, we're praying, we're trying to do all things the Lord says he wants his church to do. That we're engaged in much more of a battle than it just, than just involving us down here on earth striving to keep ourselves faithful to God. This is a cosmic battle. There are things going on beyond 
the physical, that has to do with war against Satan. We don't see all of that, but we play an integral part of it. And we prove to God how much we love him and care for him by obedience to him here, though we are tempted to go the way of most people. So there is a woe pronounced upon them. As you read down through here, you'll notice these, that the uh, archangel, Michael, said, the Lord rebuke you. Now what is that telling me? I don't need to get up here and say, out of my own authority, I'm telling you you're wrong. Why do we quote scripture? Why do we send people back to the word of God to say, compare your life and what you believe with what the Bible teaches? That's saying, let the Lord lead you. Let the Lord guide you. And we constantly say, that's not me telling you that. That's the Bible. Well, that's true. And that's exactly what uh, Michael the archangel was doing when he said, the Lord rebuked thee. In other words, I'm servant, servant of God. It's his will, thus and so, whatever was going on about the matter. And so that's the way we should be on earth, dealing with the people around about us. If we ever tell somebody that they need to change or whatever, we need to do our dead level best to say, it's not me. It's not of my think so and opinion, the likes or dislikes. It's what God has said in his infallible book, the Bible, given to lead us from earth to heaven. As we go down through here, we'll see that uh, they corrupt themselves, according to him, with all sorts of carnal knowledge, as he calls it. They readily are interested in that, which reminds us of the statement, ever learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. I see all these people with umpteen PhDs, all sorts of expertise and other learning, and they can't understand the Bible. It doesn't interest them. I see people that are religious who are following human doctrines and the approach to the Bible, and they can't figure out Acts 2, verse 38, Acts 22, 16. They can't figure those out because they're seeing them through colored spectacles. And we just can't allow that to happen for ourselves or anybody else. That's how we'll deceive ourselves and end up believing a lie. So when you see these characters that are discussed here, remember, brethren, we're having to live just like we know the New Testament says we live here if they would be faithful when this letter reached them. One of the best ways there is to keep the church faithful to God is when each member realizes whenever there's even the appearance of a deviation or something presenting itself as it is the word of God, when it's not, is to fight it. You realize that? What's the best way for you physically if you've got an ailment to get rid of it? Ignore it. Act like it's not there. Just tell yourself, my doctor said it, but he's just a human putting on his pants one leg at a time. It's like I do. What does he know about anything? Well, granted, doctors are not God. Some of them may think they are, but they're not. And then we want to rule out our, our own think so and anything. But the point is, we wouldn't do that most of the time when it comes to something when we're not feeling good. We'd go to seek those who are trained to help us. But it doesn't seem that a lot of folks get that when it comes to living life. Now, we say, well, they just don't know. If they were to look throughout history, they would see people in general commit the same silliness and hurt over and over again. But what do they learn about covetousness? Nothing. They just keep being covetous. What do they learn about lying? I remember one time a preacher who's now dead who, when he was a little boy, he told this, well, he told this about when he was a little boy. He said they had a murder there in the county and it had all the county stirred up, big crowd at the courthouse for the trial and they put the charged man, the man accused of murder, on the stand and after he'd been on the stand a long time being questioned and all that, then at the break, he overheard men. He said, I was just a little boy, but I overheard men walking out saying, 
I cannot believe he sat there before all this crowd that knows him and lied through his teeth. And he said, I thought then as a little boy. Why wouldn't you believe that? He murdered somebody. We are funny people. We can't believe that anybody would lie. We can't believe that anybody would rape, pillage, or steal. Well, I guess there's none of it going on. I can't believe it. And the thing really gets bad when it comes down to people, our own families, who are not godly, who won't do right. We find everything under the sun to justify them in their sins. Why? What good are we doing when we do that? You have to face reality and then deal with it on God's terms. That's just exactly how it works. That's what you did in becoming a Christian. And if you sin after having become a Christian, you deal with it too. So it's nothing that surprised anybody. It's just what we do because that's facing reality in the light of God's rightly divided word in treating such matters. Woe unto them. Well, that's not W-H-O-A. Stop, like we say to horse. It is an announcement of a terrible uh, plague, if you please. Woe unto them, for they've gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Cory. Now, right there shows you something about the value of knowing your Old Testament to make a New Testament application. If you haven't read your Old Testament and you don't know about who Cain is, or who Balaam is, or who Cory is, you won't know what's going on here. And yet, if you turn over to the book of Revelation, you'll see in uh, chapter 2, to the letter, the letter to the church at Pergamos, <clears throat> verse 14, but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. Well, the book of Revelation is written in symbols, figurative language. These old wrong ones who are persecuting the church can read verse 14, won't have any idea whatsoever he's talking about, because they don't know anything about the Old Testament. <clears throat> but that says God expected those Christians to know it and make the application so they would not commit the same sin. Now he's writing here to these Christians saying, you can't do like these folks. You cannot commit the sins they committed and get away with it. Because what kind of people are these among you? spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you feeding themselves without fear clouds they are without water carried about of winds trees whose fruit withereth without fruit twice dead plucked up by the roots raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever now can you paint a more woeful picture with words than that for those who die contrary to God's will? I don't think so. Seems to me like Jude is saying, I mean business. I'm talking about what will happen to you if you don't do right. I'm talking about what you must do to keep separate from all this culture that's around you and how they live. It's not something where you're rushing through it to get able to get home and do whatever it is you do there that's pleasant. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 <clears throat> of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to commence all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Now remember the beginning of this little one-chapter book said, I was constrained to write unto you to earnestly contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. I was going to write to you just about things that are pertinent to everyday Christian living. That is common to all faithful Christians. But something happened, and he got right on what was urgent. Now, we're sitting here, reasonable comfort this afternoon, but I assure you if all of a sudden that doorway right there blew out and fire was there, it would change the whole thing, especially as to what is urgent among ourselves. 
Well, things can happen like that in society. And brethren, we're in that today in America. We're in the big middle of it today. And the church must become aware of it and must realize what's happening within the church and has been happening for years and is snowballing as the people's care for the authority of Christ, authority in general in our society, and the truth of God in the New Testament as it comes to how one becomes a Christian, the organization working and worship with the church. We can't isolate ourselves in such a way as we just don't realize fully what's happening all around us until it's too late. He says, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons and admiration because of advantage. Does that sound like anybody you know today or any group of people in this country? Then he says, but beloved, remember the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we need to do. Tell me why verse 17 is not as fresh and up-to-date and needful right now as it was when Jude wrote it. That's the only thing that's going to help us. Peter would even say this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in which both I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So we need to ever remember the truth. Remember the early church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. Well, that's what he's saying here. How are you going to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine without remembering the doctrine? Without remembering we're to do all things by the authority of Christ and understanding how the New Testament authorizes. So he says how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves. Notice the caliber of people. That's spiritual. They're sensual. They don't have the spirit. But ye, beloved. In other words, you're different. You're different if you're God's people. You're different if you're God's people because you do God's will to become God's people and you live faithful to him. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of God of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Keep yourselves in the love of God. You know, I can do and you can do for me and I can do for you. We can do for one another all we can to help each other. Study the Bible, to assemble with the saints, to give as we've prospered, to be ready unto every good work, to know that pure and undefiled religion has to do with helping the widows and orphans and keeping oneself unspotted from the world. We can know all of that. And yet, it, when it comes right down to it, all of that urging and helping and praying is to no avail if I don't just put my nose to the grindstone and get it done. It's just the way it works. Notice verse 22, and of some have compassion making a difference. He's telling you the difference between hard-hearted teachers of error, whatever it may be, and some who get overcome with that error, but they're just led astray. What are we to do about that? Well, you always, on a case-by-case case matter, deal with the situation as you have it. You know, let's just take a flock of sheep, since the Lord likened the church to a flock of sheep. You're going to de deal with an old realm considerably different from the way you would deal with a lamb. And that's true in the flock of God. People are at different degrees of, well, I could say apostasy, and that would be right. They're at different degrees of growth and development spiritually. And you have to deal with them accordingly. So we do have compassion. Interesting in all of this that he mentions compassion in the middle of all of it. Concerned about others. And others say with fear, but notice the urgency of it. Pulling them out of the fire. Interesting, he says, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. There are those who are going to live sensual lives because they make their choices up or make their choices on the basis of physical appeal. Sensual. It's not a matter of the appeal of the scriptures, the teaching of the scriptures, and bringing one's mind in subjection to the truth, Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's a matter of how it feels how it moves upon us in those things. 
and the church is full of that kind of thing today. We measure things the way people measure them as to their worth or what ought to be and ought not be, not on the basis of the Bible's teaching, but on the basis of how I think, how it looks to me, and I just don't think y'all should have done that. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. If I could tell you throughout the years I've preached different people who've come up and said something like that, the elders or other people trying to get someone to repent of sins, they say, well, I just think y'all should have done that another way. That usually is a response when you say, well, we're trying to get a person to repent of their sins. And then you say, they say, well, but couldn't you have done this this way? Couldn't you have done I don't know what that means, except really the only way that they want you to do it is let the people alone and let them go on to hell. And that's, I know, is not love. So we are always battling my think so and likes and dislikes with what the Bible says. Last two verses, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior, the glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. There's where it's got a sinner. Got a center in Christ and His will and our doing it, let come what may. That's when you know you love yourself, you love God, and you love everybody else like they ought to be loved. It's when every time you deal with people, you're trying to get them to obey God and trying to show them that they're not or they are and encourage them if they're doing it. They're just no other way around it. Now, that's the world in which we live. You say, well, what's the difference? This is 60, 70, 80 years ago. Because there's far more in this world today who don't know God, don't know the Bible, and just don't care about it. And they're more now to the point of actually and openly fighting against it and those who believe it. And they're apt to do no telling what to you if they really find out you're telling them that the way they're living is wrong and they should quit. That's always been the case, but in a society that is running over with outright rebellion, then it's apt to come back on us much more quickly than otherwise. But we've never been promised a time as we live rightly that we can be free of persecution. We've said that many times because as Paul told Timothy 2,000 years ago, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You make up your mind to do what's right and let the persecution come. It has to be that way or you won't even get the first base in serving Christ. If you're not a child of God, we urge you to believe the gospel, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and be buried with your Lord in baptism to obtain the remission of sin. If as a child of God you slipped, you let things come into your life because of this culture and society and stuff around us, and all we can do is beg and plead by the mercy of Christ that you recognize it, you repent of it, you turn from it and you ask for forgiveness having confessed those sins. If you're subject then to the gospel invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing this song.